If you work in enterprise security, and in particular, if you run a security operations center, then you're familiar with the concept of preparedness. That is absolutely essential to dealing with threats, reducing your risk, and really driving operational excellence. Today, I have a, a discussion with a longtime friend of mine, an expert in this area. She runs an amazing company. I want you to stick around. I think you're going to learn something from our discussion. Hi, Matt Amoroso from Tag Cyber. I want to welcome you to our discussion today. I have a, a friend and colleague who I've worked with for many years, Debbie Gordon. She runs a company called CloudRange. Um, they are, in my mind, the leader in preparing security operations teams to be ready, to be prepared for, for who knows what is coming. And she'll share with you some insight that she's developed. But um, Debbie, I want to welcome you to our discussion. It's nice to to catch up. I'm looking forward to hearing um, how things are going. Thanks, Ed. I'm always happy to be here. It's nice to catch up with you again. You guys have grown like a weed the last few years. You just keep growing with them. Um, as we run into companies, I, I see them using your service and always pretty pleased with the uh, result. Give us a just quick thumbnail on what you guys do. And then I want to talk to you about six factors that seem to be driving mm -hmm. the push that so many people are, are, are experiencing to do uh, SOC readiness. But tell us a little bit about the company. Sure. Uh, so CloudRange exists to help companies be prepared for forthcoming cyber attacks. And as you know, um, you know, we hear about them every every single day in the news. And um, most organizations spend an average of over 200 million, large organizations spend an average of over $200 million on trying to prevent cyber attacks, yet we still hear about them. Um, and there's something that all of them have in common, and that is that the people who were paid to defend against those attacks and detect and respond to them simply didn't know what they were looking for or looking at. And it's not their fault. They had just never seen it before. So CloudRange developed a very advanced simulation platform that enables organizations to proactively prepare for a multitude of types of cyber attacks so that when something does happen, they know exactly how to respond so that we don't hear about it in the news. You know, let's go back to this threat sort of driver, because I think that's one of the main factors that explains the, um, the rapid adoption of your platform. Your team had shared with me, I think, a number 114 percent increase just in the uh, second quarter of this year. I was surprised it was it sounded that low. Um, is that what you're, I mean, uh, fundamentally, that's the problem, right? That we just, it seems like it never starts to wane, which uh, it just keeps the threat intensity keeps growing. Has that been yeah. your experience in talking to customers? Well, it has, and I think that um, just industry-wide and globally, um, the bad guys don't rest. The bad guys don't rest when our government decides they might shut down. Um, the bad guys don't rest on holidays. Um, and so there are more and more ways to attack. The threat surface is getting significantly larger. There's more tools and technologies. There's more third-party software. Um, and so the risks continue to increase. But at the same time, uh, there's also a very grave talent shortage which leaves empty seats in organizations for people who are trying to defend or who need to defend. Uh, and those empty seats actually represent a vulnerability, no different than a vulnerability in a software that needs to be patched. Yeah, let's go back to the attack surface that you'd mentioned, because it seems mm -hmm. to me like that is, like somebody says, what, what's the issue? Why is this so hard? I think that's part of it, right? Is, is that, as you're working with teams and training their SOC, um, the SOC staff and team. Does that theme come up a lot, this idea that it used to be a simple kind of thing to protect an enterprise? Now you sort of sprawling attacks. Yeah, uh, it is, and, and it's expanding, and we see it even more on the OT side. Organizations don't even know what assets they have. And so on the IT side, they think they know. On the OT side, they acknowledge that they don't know, and they're very surprised when they realize they have all these um, all these assets that can be attacked, uh, and even worse, they just don't even know how to defend against them. You've been talking about OT for a while, and I, you know, in our practice at TAG, we've started to work in the area of climate science. We're watching industrial control get completely redesigned yeah. around sustainability initiatives. So I have a feeling 
you're going to be pretty busy, um, you know, as companies redesign. Let's talk about the regulators and the mm -hmm. compliance requirements, because that's another big thing, right? As if it's yeah. not hard enough dealing with, your point, the bad guys who don't sleep. Now, I think regulators, and obviously they're doing it because they have the right motivation, but boy, as an operator, sometimes it doesn't feel like that. It feels like you're getting beat up on all, on, on all fronts. What what like for example the SEC mandates and so on? How is that sort of driving, uh, you know, cu customers to come and and ask, "Hey, Debbie, we need uh, need your help." Boards are asking the right questions now because of some of the SEC mandates and regulations. The boards are asking the questions because they're required to have um, somebody with a cybersecurity background, and so they know what questions to ask. They're able to think critically, and so where we come in there when something happens and there's an attack and somebody on the board calls up the CIO or the CISO and says, hey, are we prepared for this? We're really worried about it. Um, the CISO can say, you know what? We just did a simulation on this, we're good. And so we are developing those simulations based on what's happening out in the wild. Uh, we use different sources of threat intelligence. So, you know, alerts from CISA, for example, um, we turn those into something that is actionable versus just words. And so uh, boards of directors, now that they have a lot more focus on cyber, and not just because of the SEC regulations, but just in general, it's, you know, it's a, there's a fiduciary responsibility to the company and they realize that that can land on cyber, um, that there's a lot, there, the questions are being asked now in a, in a much more specific way than just um, crossing their fingers and hoping. The, the sort of personal nature of the liability with SEC, I think, is kind of concerning. You know, yeah. I, I would imagine that where previously requesting an investment in your solution would be part of the day-to-day -day business as usual, ask with your budget. I mean, I would see some my whole life. So it's like, you know, it's a, I'm asking for price for, you know, for cost for a vendor to support a mm -hmm. license. But, but you guys do something a little deeper because now it feels like there's a personal liability there, particularly for the CISO. Like if you're aware they need, of the yeah, they need data and they get that from cloud range because traditional training and we don't, we don't consider ourselves a training company. Um, and that that's because we are about readiness at, for an organization, not just giving somebody some skills that they can go take somewhere else, but everything that cloud range does with its customers, translates into a reduction of risk. So the more, and I'll make this, you know, put this very simply, um, the more types of TTPs that uh, have been addressed and uh, com successfully completed in simulations, the more uh, prepared an organization is for when those TTPs might come about. And I'm being very simplistic about this, um, but at the end of the day, we're able to show a measurable decrease in the operational risk, which the board likes to see versus um, basic cybersecurity training, which often just gets, you know, check a box. Every employee has gotten X number of hours of uh, CPE credits, you know, that doesn't tell how an organization is reducing its risk, but um, our customers really like the fact that we're able to translate their investment into a reduction of risk. We make them sleep better at night because they can see the impact of what we do um, and they can translate and tran and communicate that uh, effectively to their board. Well, when I hear people talk about being understaffed in the SOC, I used to say, well, you know, just go recruit harder, you know, or, or um, come talk to some of my graduate students, offer them jobs, whatever. but I think you, I remember you telling me, and it really affected my thinking, that by training a team as a unit and, and making them effective, you know, certainly it's going to help with retention, but it's also going to help with effectiveness. And perhaps some of that understanding may be less of an issue if the team is, is operating effectively. Have you seen that effect? In any kind of teamwork, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, you know, whether yeah. it's sports or cyber defense. And so um, a lot of leaders are acknowledging and taking action on the fact that they have to grow their own talent. You can't go and find experienced people. Um, and if you do, you're plucking them from another company and you're not solving the problem. You're just perpetuating it. And then the salaries have to go up and it's a, you know, it's an economics thing. It's supply and demand. And so 
I'm really pleased when I see and hear about uh, security leaders and, you know, most of our customers are fall into this category that they acknowledge that they have to find people who have will and then they can give them the skill. And that includes working as a team. So a lot of our customers are using cloud range to accelerate the onboarding of a new analyst, for example. They immerse them into simulations, not just as an individual, but with a team. So, you know, imagine joining a, a football team. You can go do individual uh, skills training, you know, things that are measured in a combine. But once you get on the field with that team, things are going to change really quickly and you're going to know whether you can play or not and how well you play. And the quick and the better, the more that people are exposed to the different uh, roles and functions and dynamics of a team, the better they're going to perform. So one of the things that I have been um, pleasantly uh, surprised by and, and maybe enlightened is the right word, is the fact that the soft skills um, communication, collaboration, confidence, um, all of these things are truly the weakest link in the chain, if not, if not effective. So technical skills, they need them, but if they don't have the soft skills, they're not going to be successful. And so, and, and it's kind of funny because my formal education is in human behavior, small group behavior and organizational development and never did I ever expect that, you know, that in cybersecurity uh, would meet so in such a, an important way. So, um, yeah, the team is the most effect, most important part. There's tons of cybersecurity training out there for individuals. Um, a lot of the labs companies, um, just a lot of them. And, and unless you train as a team with with live fire, live traffic, live attacks, it's like learning to throw a football, but you never actually play on the field. It's been transformational for me because when people complain to my team about we don't have enough folks in our ops mm -hmm. environment, I always ask, have you taken the time to do, to have them work together in a preparedness initiative? And it's it's usually, if they're not your customer, then it's usually no. And you well, think, don't you think you ought to do that? Wouldn't that maybe get them working and just produce a little higher level of harmonization? And their answer probably is yes, they ought to do it. Um, but you and I both know that important and urgent do, ought, do not always coexist. No, well, that's and why we're so, talking. We've got to get yeah. people to bump this up. They know what they need to do. But if you think about the talent shortage, even security leaders can't keep up because they're managing people who are overworked and overburdened. They don't have time to think proactively and do all this. So that's why part of our whole program uh, is not only just our platform for simulation, it's ensuring that we do the heavy lifting to make sure that our customers are doing the simulations, um, not waiting for them to quote unquote have time, um, because having time is about the same amount of time that I have time to go to the gym. I have to plan it. Uh, and if I don't plan it, I don't go. And it's the same thing for proactive preparation and training. If it's not planned, if it's not scheduled, it's not gonna get done. You know, it has um, all the, the kind of attention around artificial intelligence, AI, has that affected kind of people's, say, um, uh, view of threat and of the attack surface and so on? Do you, is that a theme that comes up as you're talking to, uh, to SOC teams and to their management? It, it comes up every day. Um, it's, you know, in any industry, AI is kind of the, you know, the, the, the hot topic. Um, there's a lot of discussion about it, and personally, the way I see it is at the end of the day, it's a tool for both sides. It's a yeah. tool for offense and defense. And so the playing field is, you know, it's relatively equal. Um, and so there are AI tools for analysts to use for cyber defense, uh, and there's analysts for the bad guys, or I'm sorry, there's AI for the bad guys. And so, um, it's just another way that we have to just make sure we're staying on our toes. Um, we're, you know, we use it in our uh, in our platform in various ways, and you'll be seeing some more of that um, be released in the very near future. But you know, it's like any technology, or you know, if you think about the internet, um, the internet gave us information and quicker access to information, and that's what AI does. You know, it's quicker access, and so we and we all have that luxury. I like to think of it that way.
One thing your team showed me personally that I thought was super interesting was all the pre-integration that you do with different vendors. That's got mm -hmm. like, if there are vendors listening to us right now, I hope they call you. It seems like such a natural thing that you'd want your platform embedded into a live fire range. Do you, is it more, are you usually reaching out to vendors on behalf of your clients or do they come, you get a lot of inbound where they ask to be included in your platform? Probably both. Um, and, and just to, you know, share with the audience what, what the context here is, our cyber range platforms are all virtual. Um, so we don't touch anything on somebody's network, but we're able to mimic the relevant tools and technologies that they have um, so that when they're going through a simulation, they're using familiar tools. So whether it's, um, you know, name your SIM, name your firewall, name your EDR solution, we have partnerships with all of those companies that I'll refer to as the usual suspects. Um, you know, that most enterprises have one of a handful in each of the categories. And so um, when we are partner, we partner with those companies, they provide our solution to their customers. Um, they're also using it in some different ways internally as well. So um, those partnerships are amazing. We continue to grow those partnerships, both on the OT and the IT side. For people watching, if you're, again, if you're working a vendor, listen to what Debbie said, the usual suspects. If you'd like to be a usual suspect, you probably ought to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you think about it, you know, they, every technology's customers, they're using their, your tools already. Uh, so you want them to be become more effective while using your tools. We're not teaching people how to use a firewall, you know, a specific uh, OEM brand. We are teaching them, or our, I should say our platform enables them to learn what to do with those in a live environment. It's one thing to know how to write a firewall rule, but when do you write it? Why do you write it? How do you make the decision to do that and with whom? And so all of the critical thinking that goes along with using the tools uh, in a multi-vendor environment is so important. Debbie, I want to ask you, I'm assuming that across the different sectors, say commercial, federal, state, government, all these, probably working across the board, because any place there's a sock, there's a need. Am I reading that right? I, I, I have a hard time thinking whether there would be an industry that would be more or less served here. It seems like all of them. Do I yeah. Have that right? I know it's funny because investors never want to hear, oh, we're, you know, we apply to any company, you know, we're, we're useful for any company. But, um, you know, there, there are industries that in invest a little more you know banking for example financial services healthcare um critical infrastructure is something that is becoming more and more uh, of a focus from an investment standpoint um organizationally a lot of those companies haven't quite caught up with the the need they know it's out they know there's a risk out there but they don't actually they don't even have their organizational act together to know whose job it is, whether it's the IT side or the OT side. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's applicable really to any industry. We have customers in, in every vertical, um, some more than others, but that, you know, that may be just a coincidence, but it is applicable to anybody. Debbie, for folks who may be watching and they think, all right, I'm sold, I want to do this. They just go on your website or what, what, what's the best way for somebody to reach out to set up a discussion about um, developing a relationship and getting your service into their SOC? Yeah, so uh, our website is www.cloudrangecyber.com um, and uh, we, are, we have a process where we get to uh, provide a, an actual simulation to customers, they they will experience it because this is a new thing. You know, we've we've been around for five years and and an industry leader, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of companies who've never seen this. It's kind of like when the flight simulator was invented. You know, people hadn't seen it, they hadn't heard about it, and so you have to show it to them. Um, but once our customers start using this, uh, we have a 97% retention rate. So it obviously is something that's extremely valuable to companies. You're never finished. Um, there's always more to be prepared for and um, they're continuing to make that investment uh, because of that. Well, please keep up the good work. You know, I'm a big fan of this area of cybersecurity. I can't think of a single reason why a security operations team would not be doing this. This is one where you're not doing it. That's almost like the pilots not doing uh, their training. That's a big mistake. So if you're, you're watching right now, good. listening to my voice, make sure you get in touch with um, Debbie and her team and, and um, 
and, and let me know afterwards what you think. But Debbie, as always, great to catch up. Um, keep up the good work. We need you guys to be doing this in our industry, and I do appreciate everything you guys do for us. Thank you, Ed, and you keep up the good work too. I appreciate it. And for everyone else watching, we'll see you next time.